I have been uh, in this position about seven years and it's evolved over time and um, we've seen lots and lots of great things happen um, with this program. So, There it goes. So um, I don't. I just wanted to share with you briefly. This is the strategic plan that we have uh, at the Mayborn that we're working on right now. And the first um, big idea and and uh, the second big idea are where my work focuses and where our partnership with postdocs and Baylor researchers is um, where the rubber hits the road to say. So the first one is support Baylor's goal of becoming an R1 tier one research or R1 tier one university. And um, we like you were thrilled when we got that announcement um, because we've seen the, the good work that so many researchers have done in the way that the chief brother impacts at the university. Um, when Carlos Brickhouse first came to Baylor, she came to meet, visit with us. And I recall her saying, find the part of the puzzle for the university that you can fit in and focus your efforts there. And so this is where we have chosen to do that at the Mayborn. And um, it involves primarily my team, but there's also a lot of support across the museum for this. So I wanted uh, you to hear, this is a really quick little um, blurb, if I can find the play button. Anyway, let me let me set it up. Here we go. Let me set it up. This is Charlie Walter, who's our director, and Charlie is the one that uh, brought Portal to the Public to us. And um, his passion is science and informal learning. And so, listen to what he has to say about that. Hello, uh, I'm really glad to hear the part of our Portal to the Public. I'm Charlie Walter. I'm director of the Make Work Museum. You can tell the stuff in front of me. I've really been a passion. I love sharing that. I've learned a lot to you. There's special skills involved. I'll work to be the person who is the best. I know each of you have discipline that you're a good at it. You love it. You just want to share some insight. It's a good topic. It's very exciting that you're here. What was the topic? Help you understand more about what's called informal learning. That's learning that is outside the formal classroom, but importantly, it's also learning driven by the learner. So that's why it's so important. You know why some of you want to buy your table? Because it does not your thing. But artifacts, or pillows, just throw them in the bin, then you can make fun. That's a more meaningful experience. So, thank you so much. Uh, we're really excited here at the Baylor, Baylor University Alphabet Science and Art. It means a lot for us at the museum to be here. It really enriches our visitor experience. And I just want to thank you. Charlie is often seen when you guys come to the museum. So he loves uh, to support you all. And he um, he has brought a lot of exciting things to the Mayborn. So, uh, okay, Hello. that's not what I want. Here we go. So, you know, Charlie mentioned informal learning is learning that's driven by the learner. And um, I think that's the part that is the most motivating for them and for you, because it's not, it's not, preparing for a test or preparing for uh, a project, it is true learning for its intrinsic value. Um, I previously taught in public schools and I used to say when kids came to the museum and families came to the museum, that this was the place where what they learned in the classroom was fun because they could touch things and they could do things and they could see demonstrations and talk to real experts about what the science uh, that they're looking at is, is uh, about. So um, I just put about five topics or hotspots for informal learning that I think uh, if you can get these things kind of in your head, it helps things run smoothly. So usually informal learning begins with the conversation. Um, have you seen something like this before? Or what do you think this is? Or um, do you like mosquitoes or whatever your, your uh, science is? And it, 
the the next part I think is very important because we set situations up so that the learner is not um, put in a position to be afraid of saying the wrong thing. And so the risk there, there, there's a low risk for them. And so that means there's a, a better uh, chance that they're going to, to uh, participate more. Um, and, and again, I mentioned this a second ago, the intrinsic motivation is within the learner. And that is um, critical, I think, you know, and, and sometimes people don't have a lot of interest in what you might prepare be presenting at first, but then when they learn some things about it and learn how it impacts their lives, it, it would make, it makes a difference. And I can give you a personal example of this, that we had some um, researchers come, they were working with a PI and it was before I took this position. So I don't, I can't tell you who it was. Anyway, there were, their research was about silver nitrate and the, the effect it could have on us. And I remember they had a sieve with some little, um, with rice in it or orzo pasta, one of those things. And they uh, were talking about the silver particles that are in socks, you know, to, to deal with bacteria and all that kind of stuff. And they would tap that sieve and you could see the pasta or the rice coming through. And then they could, they use that as a demo to, to say, we have strict guidelines about how much silver to put in socks or in clothes so that it doesn't damage the body. We pay attention to these kinds of things. Well, I can't tell you the vast work of the research, but I can remember the general principles about it. And I remember the room where they were in and lots of questions came about because they had this one example that people could relate to. And then they learned about why this matters to them in their um, real life. Again, I think that leads to elevated engagement. And uh, the last thing I think that scientists don't realize how much the story they have to tell about their own career path and their own interest is compelling because people put scientists in a category that's different from them because they think I'm not a scientist. I can't do that. And we've learned that when you make those connections and tell those stories, interests are sparked and, you know, especially young teens and, and young older children think, oh, maybe I can do that. So the, those kinds of things are all a, a, an important component of informal learning. Um, our portal to the public training um, is very valuable and we've, we've received a lot of positive feedback about this, even though some of the activities might seem um, simple, but the skills that are honed in the midst of these activities that really are, we hear lots of laughter and lots of, oh my goodness, or I should have done this or whatever, but the, there's a lot of learning that takes place in those. So um, our training is the portal to the public training. We've taken components of it and we train scholars to engage on the floor. And then um, we just, this, this slide actually I took from our training, but um, the ways that portal helps is that for the public, it teaches the, our visitors that anyone and everyone can do STEM and that STEM is important in their lives. And we do stress um, in our training, find a way to tell the public and tell the people you meet what is the value that your their research has on their lives. You know, um, that I even had to do that as a public school educator. Why is it important that we learn this? It's the same thing here. And so we were intentional about crafting that message and helping scientists craft that message so people can understand it. And then uh, visitors do get hands-on lessons in STEM topics. And you can see this picture right here. These are two um, young women that uh, I'm sure they have graduated by now, but they were part of Michael Scullin's neuro, uh, sleep lab, neuroscience sleep lab. And you can see all the things they have out there. And they were comparing these objects to um, different parts of their research and it's not in this picture but there's a, an acrylic skull right here and one of the things that I saw them do with a styrofoam skull one time is put push pins in it and they put rubber bands around the push pins to show the connections that the brain makes and there were tons of them that skull was model was covered with them but those are the kinds of hands-on things that we, we work to help you um, 
craft and hone to present. And then for the science community, it gives you, the researcher, tools and opportunities to grow in your communication skills. And then it, it strengthens um, your broader impacts um, NSF grant proposals. Um, Portal to the Public is an NSF sponsored program and funded by NSF. And so when that's listed on a resume or that's listed as a part of a, a grant proposal, it um, is noted. So then these are just some really quick, uh, no need to remember all this because we certainly, certainly are available to talk through this, but I just wanted you to see um, some of the offerings that we have at the Mayborn that we plug in our Mayborn research partners, which is what we call, we used to call you guys portal scientists, but now we're calling you Mayborn research partners. So we have meet scientists that meets um, every Friday and Saturday. And um, it, you're, you're, uh, there's flexibility for you to schedule what you want to do. And um, in fact, Saturday, we have two different groups coming. We have um, Dr. Riz Klossmeyer's science fellows that um, are undergrads that are on a research track, and they're going to be doing demonstrations. And then we have um, Dr. Joe Yelderman is coming because it's World Water Day, and his whole class went through our Portal to the Public training to be able to present activities tomorrow. And um, they had a, a wonderful um, time together. You could just feel it. And afterwards, Dr. Yelderman told me, the bonding that we did today was really good, and I wish we'd started this earlier in the semester. Um, but they will be there along with Melissa Mullins, who's also from the biology department, and she's in charge of Crasser. And I can never remember what all those things, but it's water research and water quality. And um, they do water testing, and they do all kinds of activities. So Saturday will be a big day with lots of uh, Maywood research partners. And if you're interested, uh, you're a student and you can come free. So if you want to drop in and see what happens on Saturday, please do. Um, we have uh, research partners that come at spring break because spring break is always busy for us. Um, Sickle Science Day is in the fall. It's a big day where we highlight our Maywood research partners. And then we also do um, chemistry magic show at the end of the day where Daryl, uh, Darren Bellert uh, blows up things with liquid nitrogen and it's a big deal. We've had a community following for over 10 years now. So it's a fun, fun day. Um, if, you're, if your uh, discipline has a special day like water, World Water Day or National Sleep Day, um, we are happy to provide you a menu to do activities to highlight that and we, we publicize that within our social social media platforms. Gallery talks are for our, our adult audiences and the uh, public engagement community uh, engagement team uh, schedule researchers to give um, brief talks and then available for Q&A and we have um, we have one coming up really shortly with Dr. Huey and she's also in neurosciences and her research is about the effects of alcohol on uh, especially teens, but also uh, adults. And she's also this time gonna talk about drug interactions. So that those are very timely topics for the public. And there will be a lot of uh, opportunities to share your latest, latest research, but also opportunities for the public to gain knowledge. And then the community days at the Mayborn, there's three of them a year and those days are free to the public. So we see lots of folks. So it's a great opportunity to, to share your work. Um, next, why is science education and informal learning important? These are just some things that I yesterday kind of put pen to paper to think, what is the value of this to you? Um, what it, one of the things that I've mentioned a couple of times, and I can't say it enough, people need to know why your research matters to them. They need to know what can this, how can this make my life better? Another person that we see a lot, and some of you might know Kaylee Rice now, and Kaylee does breast cancer research, and she's been with us for a long time. And um, she has hard topics to talk about, but there are very few people that walk through the door of that museum that don't have a family member or a colleague that's been touched by cancer. So, there's, a, there's an automatic buy-in to that. So your, your research does matter to people's lives. Um, this, doing the training that we offer and also doing um, the outreach on the floor with us gives you opportunities to, to effectively hone and develop communication skills because nobody 
has that innate ability. <laughs> you know, it's a learned skill and you learn not only in the training, that's just to get your feet wet part, but you learn by engaging with people. Okay, that didn't work this time. What could I have done differently? Or man, I, I really like that. I think I could extend this. And, and we will give you as many opportunities as you want to practice those kinds of things. Um, I think for scientists, you're being able to communicate what you research and what you do is part of your everyday life. Um, Anne Spence is a professor in the engineering department and her students went through, this was before COVID, she had several students that came and she said it was so valuable because they didn't realize how this could help them making presentations not only for class but in the industry and in their career. Um, and we have a son who's an engineer who graduated from Baylor and he has to use those kind of skills all the time when he works with clients. So um, practicing those communication skills is a, is a really important aspect. Um, we also want to create an environment where the public is, is engaged and they can gain knowledge and um, also to support your research. So again, it's this partnership and that, that I think scientists and the public really need to work to build up because it's an important one. And then introduce the joy and value of science to younger generations. Again, this kind of goes back to telling your story and to having a format that's different than a textbook and to see the joy that comes from that. Charlie often talks about the museum as a place of joyful learning. And uh, we are seeing that pick up since COVID is, is done. There are lots of activity all the time. Um, one of the things that um, I, I talked to Kaylee about this presentation, I said, tell me if you're sitting in the chair, what are some things you want to hear? And this was one of the things she highlighted. What are the ways to improve science communication skills? Practice and experiment in a variety of settings. And many of our grant writers over the last year have purposely written into their grants opportunities for outreach with families, which would be a younger audience with teens and then with adults. And that they have been very intentional about uh, making their research available to a, a, an array of ages and audiences. I think not only in the training, but I also think in events that we do, the opportunity to network with other scientists is um, really, really valuable. And, and I see that in our training, even when they're not in the same discipline. You know, they, well, we do this in hours and then, oh yeah, I could do that, but spin it this way. So I think that net, the networking opportunities are really important as you improve your communication skills. We, at the, after each of our events, we do informal reflections. We have, I have a graduate uh, apprentice who's taking notes and making comments and then we share that with you all. Um, and we're always available to evaluate what went well or what, what could, even from our end, what could we have done to make this better for you or what changes do we need to make? Um, but there's that informal reflection and evaluation, I think, is a, a really strong component of what we do. And then a selfless plug, ways to improve your science communication skills or come to portal to the public training at the Maywarn. Um, and we offer those at least three times a year. We've added a fourth one. Um, that we're going to do um, with a lab um, this coming Thursday, I think. Not tomorrow, but the next Thursday. <laughs> but anyway, so, um, and we, we have seen a lot of uh, ticking, what's my word? More, more requests for um, labs to come and just their training, you know, or like Dr. Yeldon's class, a, a training for that. We are happy to do that. We have found though that we gotta have it, we need to have at least three to four people in the training. Because if you don't have that interaction, this is a training on engagement. There's no way to engage with it. It kind of loses its muster. Okay, and then the last thing, I hope you've heard me in things I said today, but let me just blatantly say it. We are here to support you. That is our role. And um we want to give you opportunities for outreach. We want to, uh, we, have, uh, we have some equipment that's available. You know, we have large screen televisions and monitors and um, that we, you can bring your uh, content on a flash drive and we'll have it there. You can hook up, we have Apple TVs. You can have to hook up a laptop to, um, to the monitor to show your, your 
research and things you want to do. We, um, we also have some other resources at the museum. If you're looking for stuff to illustrate a point, we might likely have it. So we have a team of people that's dedicated to help you uh, share your research and to make your grades more competitive. Um, I have uh, given Blake some things to share with you all. And it's first thing, can you guys see this? Okay, okay. I never mind. I have a brochure that it, it's a new brochure that we've uh, just developed at the marketing department at the museum. And it's to highlight um, the broader impacts opportunities. And it's got some quotes some, from other people who have done broader impacts with us. It also talks about our collection, if that's of interest to you. Maybe there's some things in our collection that you could use for your research. So the brochure is being mailed out in phases across campus, but I brought, there's several for, uh, that Blake will have. Um, and my email is up there. I'm also going to leave in my cards. Um, but if you call the Mayborn and say, who does broader impacts, they will know how to get you to me. So um, I want to thank you all and um, give opportunity for questions. Blake, have you had anything in the chat? Uh, no, nothing in the chat. Um, I wonder if you could talk a little bit more about the portal training itself. Sure. Um, what's the what's the amount of time commitment? Kind of what does that look like? Um, yeah. Yeah, it's a it's a half day training and we say that it's four hours, but we've only gone to four hours one time. So it's usually about three and a half hours. And so uh, we we do um, some educating on the five foundations of learning. What are the things that people really have to know or have in place to be able to learn and learn effectively? Um, it, it's things like what kind of background do they bring? or knowledge do they bring to the topic before they get there? Or what is the environment that's conducive to helping people attain new knowledge? Um, we do some um, activities where people are literally putting themselves in the position of being a learner to play <laughs> with gadgets that they don't have any knowledge of. And, and we have an opportunity to hone questions. And you know, what when you saw this, what were the questions you had? And, 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 the wonderful benefit about this training is it's dynamic because there's other people in there. And so um, people learn from each other. We do um, an activity that is um, toward the end of the training, but it's, it's a time where people have to um, use the skills they've learned and also stretch themselves to say, I'm not I don't, I, I've got to communicate this foreign topic to them. How am I going to do this? You know, it's set up in a fun way. Um, and we always get, we always get such good feedback about that. Um, I've had one professor in particular who said every professor at this university should go through this activity because it makes you think, okay, if I say this, are they going to hear what I intend? You know, um, and then at the very end of the training, we allow some time for people to brainstorm or do this independently. What is an activity that your research is centered around? And what are specific things I can do to communicate that? So it's called, um, I just lost my train of thought, concept map. <laughs> and so there's a, a big uh, place in the center and there's all these bubbles around it that ask questions. And so um, we, we found that that has been very helpful as well because it, it literally is the meat of what you're trying to do and we give you some opportunity to begin thinking about that. And then following the training, we once that your activity is situated, we um, ask that you come in and talk to us, show us what you want to do, and we'll give you feedback because we are we have learned early on. We are not the experts on the science, but we are pretty much experts on engagement because we see it every day. And so we we will be able to tell you when you say that to me, this is what I think or I'm not sure a teenager is going to understand what you're saying. Let's think of some different ways. And a lot of it, guys, is involved with jargon, you know, because that kind of stuff is like breathing to you, but it's not breathing to somebody like me, you know. So I always tease and self-deprecate and say, if you can explain your science and your research to me and I get it, you succeeded because science is not my love language. I've learned a lot, but it, I work at it you know so um that's the training in a nutshell and we have two or three breaks and it's at 
uh, in the terrain. So I don't think it's a, you don't walk out of there exhausted. So anyway. Got a couple of good questions in the chat. Uh, one, in some of the pictures, it looks like the scientists and presenters are wearing lab coats. Are presenters encouraged to wear their typical safety or field gear during their presentations? Yes, yes, and yes. We did that on a whim, but it has proven to be very successful. I purchased from the bookstore, I think I have eight lab coats with the interlocking BU. But if you've got your own and own lab coat, great. If you, I love the, the the hint to field gear, same thing, you know, because in fact, we had that question asked when the training says semester, I don't wear a lab coat when I do my work. Um, but the reason we have found that so effective is people don't think that scientists are real people. And so they, and I know that might sound crazy to y'all, but they really, they, they feel like science is so complex that they can't the jump from there from them to being a scientist is broad for them and so um we found that showing them what real real world science is like is really beneficial the other thing that it's great for is it tells our public hey this is something different that wasn't here when i came two months ago and um again we have some lab coats in that in in our volunteer room that you're welcome to use um, they they come uh they get scarce when it's a sick and science state because I only have eight. But anyway, yes, uh, anything like that, we uh, would love for you to, to bring in where. Great. Uh, another question that uh, Sherry, I know you and I have talked about some, does the museum issue letters of support for grants if a research team has communicated that they want to partner with them for yes. science communication projects? We do uh, submit letters of collaboration, but I need to tell you, we have learned over time that there's a process to that. And when I first started this, it, people found we people find out about us from word of mouth. You know, I mean that's just how it is. And my colleague said it was great to work with the Mayborn, and we can write me a letter of collaboration. Here's what needs to be in the letter, and that's all the information I get. And so we we have learned and developed a process. So you you meet with me, and you tell me what your research is about, what what um, what are the um, the specifics of your grant, like how many years is it? And, and then I also show you um, many of the opportunities that we have and um, we have a menu actually to, to pick from. And so based on what you choose for outreach, uh, there is a cost that's affixed to that that comes out of the broader impacts portion of your grant. And so we work together to nail all that stuff down. So yes we do letters of collaboration and yes i'm happy to do it but there's a process to get there so if you if you want that don't wait till the grants do that week <laughs> because what we've learned is that doesn't work well what happens is there's not enough thought put into how you're going to do broader impacts and you you can you know I, I don't think that and blake probably can speak to this as well or better than me but Charlie's a grant reviewer, so he and I have had lots of talk conversations about this. But you want the meat of your grant and broader impacts to be strong, to be strong, and and just having a letter is not strong enough. You know, you, and and some of the grant, you know, again, I'm I'm making a plug for us here. But um, you remember last? It's probably been a year ago now when Baylor would put out the emails, then they would say we've gotten five career grants and that's the most we've ever had well for those five we work we have letters of collaboration for it and we have worked with them so we know that because of portal to the public and because of all the opportunities we have for the very age groups and audiences um we can help make those those broader impacts uh, statements uh, stronger i hope that gave enough info to address the question uh, I don't see any other questions in the chat. Uh, anyone else uh, have, if anyone else has questions, uh, feel free to either drop them in the chat or just unmute and ask. We're here in the room. If you have questions? Oh, no, I'm good. <laughs> I have a question for you all. Um, have you heard before this seminar about the Mayborn and about broader impacts of the Mayborn? A, a thumbs up would be great, or if not, that's fine. You have, okay, good. 
here's why I kind of nodded, gave a nod to this a minute ago. You know, we're we're still early on to get the word out. We are growing, and and I'm thrilled, thrilled, thrilled about that. In fact, I realized yesterday, you know, like what there's that performance review done the day I had to turn it in. I went back and checked the numbers, and we increased the number of people we trained from twenty to twenty one from year before last to last year or this year. We grew 272%. So we were we went from 11 to 41. And we were obviously thrilled about that. Um, so we know we're growing, but it is a, it's a challenge for us to get the word out for people to know. So um, So why are you guys growing? Is it because there's more initiative grants? I think than Baylor now. Partly. I also and think R1 as well. Yes, I think I think that's right. I also think that. You, you cannot imagine how many people spend four years at Baylor and never walk in the door of the night one. I, I just, I, you know, we are part of Baylor and we have always, I mean, the museum was started as the Strecker Museum and actually started as the Baylor Museum. And it was literally the, the museum had dedicated space drawn in the original architecture plans for Pat Neff. So we've been around a long time, but um, we really, through Charlie's leadership, have have worked to to uh, show our value to the university. I think you're right. I do think it's more NSF grants. I do think it's the university aiming toward our one tier one. I also think the big thing, and that's why I asked the question, is it's the word of mouth that travels, you know, that, hey, we've had great luck working, or we've had great success working. It's not luck, because it's all hard work on everybody's end. Uh, we've had great success working with the main board. And um, so, and again, I think we get and we get the field where the public comes from. So we know how to set that up so that you don't have to worry so much about that. And, um, and we're also there whenever you're at the museum, there's staff there to support you too. So um, anyway, but I, 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 I would love for you all, I'm happy to come talk to anybody. So feel free to spread the word. <laughs> One question that I, that I was thinking of as we were talking about these activities at the museum, when folks first start thinking about how they want to do these activities, how do you recommend they start thinking about a way that they can connect to an audience that's not a specialist? Uh, you know, yeah. Especially if you work in an area that is not something that's very accessible on its face. Right, right. I, I, let me go back to Kaylee. This is what I saw Kaylee do. And, and when she first started working with us, I supervised the person who was doing what I'm doing uh, now because we, we restructured our team a couple of years ago. So um, anyway, Kaylee knew that she wanted to talk about how chemotherapy affected the cancer cells. And so she brought um, her data and, and she explained to Sarah what that looked like. But together, she and Sarah came up with uh, ways to um, visualize or to demonstrate that. And they used, um, in fact, I almost brought Kaylee. We have a little video clip of Kaylee, video clip of Kaylee as well. But what they did is they used Legos and they used a model of a car and said, if you, I think it, honestly, I think it was a Lego car is what it was. But she said, if you, uh, they used round tires but they also had some square Legos and said the car didn't move well with the square ones. And so the chemotherapy, and then they had some pom-pom balls. And I think that was the chemotherapy. But anyway, they use these kind of everyday objects to say, well, the car's not working right because the wheels square, has, wheels has, has corners. The chemotherapy can attack those cells or uh, change those cells so that the tire works better. And so that, that's a very simplistic um, thing, but that's one of the things we do. And you saw that the neuroscience table. Um, I know one time they, their, their point, Michael had them doing um, activities about how the brain is malleable. And they had handfuls of Play-Doh and they would squeeze it and say, can you change this? And of course the kids knew, yeah, you could change this. And then they made the connection to your brain is able to change itself too from an injury or a trauma. 
And um, I'll tell you a sweet story to let you know why this kind of stuff is important. Um, I have a family that I'm very close with. He teaches here at Baylor and um, they go to our church and their kids are in a choir that I teach and their daughter has had a horse accident. And she's had a significant brain injury and she's doing very, very well. But I was able to tell the kids, her friends at church, her brain is malleable. And I used that same example. And the doctors kept saying, she's got to have time and a lot of things are going to heal on their own and we just have to wait. And that is happening. And she is now back going to school. But this, this example of Play-Doh and the brain is malleable was powerful not just to them, but to her friends who don't know how to act because their friend is different than it was before. So it's really kind of, uh, it's not just sweet, it's very rewarding. So, so what would you do if you're like heavier, for example, and he researches quantum computing? Yeah. You just tell the kids they're going to play faster games? Well, let, let, me, <laughs> let, me give, let me give you um, an example that might address that. We work with Jameson Graber, who was one of the career grant uh, recipients last year. And his research is, um, I, I will not recall, but it's uh, the, the exact title. But it, it's about um, how you can predict how people are, mathematically, you can predict how people are going to behave. And so he came to um, Sikkim Science and he had one of our large TVs and he had some games, a game that we had three different, you know, we had a tablet and, and a, a, on the screen and then we had a laptop, I think. So there are three different people that could play the game. And uh, it was called the Parable of the Polygons. Um, Jameson found that game. Um, I, we didn't find it, but we, we made the setup so that a lot of people could play that game. It was a hot activity that day. Because people are just drawn to a video game, you know, but he was able to use that video game then to explain why did all of these polygons group together? And I, it's, it's been since October, so I can't remember what they look like, but say they were yellow, they were yellow ones and these over here with four sides and these yellow, these, these were orange with six sides or whatever. Why do you think they're, they didn't mix up and why are they together, you know, and he could use that as a tangible example to explain the science behind it. So does that kind of help? So those kinds of things I think might be more on y'all <laughs> than they would be on us, but um, we certainly can research together and work together. But um, I think to the value of the training is that when you get to that end activity, that's where you can network with your colleagues. And, and a lot of people have different ideas. And so you um, you have opportunity to bounce ideas off of people, so. Sure, thanks. You're welcome. I wish I could tell you more, but I, you know, that is so important to me. <laughs> okay. Well, me too, yeah. Yeah, well, inch by inch, right? You're getting there. But it sounds like that's why it's so important to have a conversation about what the research is and what it involves and how can we Right. How can we distill that into a message that's accessible? Yeah, and if I had to use two words to describe the, the main components of what we do, it is the engagement strategies and how to make connections. And that's just not making connections with our colleagues. It's making connections with the audience. You know, um, th this is a very simplistic example, but um, I always hate to say this to this audience because I don't ever want people to feel like I'm... Uh, belittling anything but my former career I taught kindergarten and so I learned how to take big concepts and make narrow them so so kids could grasp them bit by bit and grow from that and so uh in fact I said this to Dr. Gelderman's group because the geosciences guys and I said I'm almost embarrassed to take this example but because I know we know a lot more about dinosaurs now than we did you know when I started teaching school a long time ago but I said one of the ways we would connect how large these fossils and dinosaurs they, we think are is I would say, I would literally take a big string or a ribbon and say, okay, his head's going to start here and we're going to walk, you know, 127 feet. Well, it would be almost to the end of the hallway. Well, 
you know, it, it was a tangible way for them to go, oh man, that, that gave them a sense of perspective. So again, I know that's very simplistic, but it, I think that we can help find tangible ways. If you get the concept to us and help us understand the concept, then we, we work together to make it more tangible. Any other questions from the from Zoom or from here in the room? Well, let me, I'll let Blake finish up, but let me thank you. Thank you for your time. Thank you for um, what you do for all of us in your research and, um, and for the role you play at Baylor to help us be stronger and better. Um, and again, uh, I'm going to leave not only this brochure but my cards uh so Blake can get you to me if you if you can't find me Blake can get you to me so anyway thank you all great well thank you Sherry and so if folks do want to get in touch with you about portal training or about other questions uh shoot me an email, shoot you an email. Mm -hmm. okay that sounds great yeah all right well thank you all for being here uh we've got uh, this recording going on right now and so we'll have this posted on the YouTube page so uh, folks can so you all can review it if you like, and so other folks can see as well. But uh, thank you all for being here. And Sherry, thank you so much for thank your time. You. And you all have a great rest of your day. And, and uh, as always, feel free to get in touch if there's anything that we can do to help you with your science communication or other, other things uh, as you're going through your postdocs. So thank you all very much. <laughs>